welcome everyone this is shobha from cns and despite the challenges posed by the covid-19 epidemic we are back today with the sixth episode of apcr shr 10 dialogues this is a special series of online interviews every fortnight with leaders in the asia pacific on the theme of social and reproductive health and rights in asia pacific the 2030 sdgs vision and the 2020 realities as they stand here this is also the theme of the 10th asia pacific conference on reproductive and sexual health and rights and for the benefit of our audience these dialogues are being streamed live on the facebook pages of apcr shr 10 and cns It is indeed a happy coincidence, which I realized later on, that today, on 13th April, many countries of our region are celebrating their New Year, as per the That's solar, right. yeah. as per the solar and lunar lunar calendar, uh, including hmm. Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar, yes, mm -hmm. uh, parts of India, uh, Sri Lanka, mm. uh, so. and others cele uh, also celebrated around this date sometimes in march and april many countries yeah. in the region yeah. uh, so the cns family wishes all of you a very happy new year and hope that year. it i hope it brings safety health and happiness to all even as we join forces and firm our resolve to take on the challenges posed by covid-19 In today's episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we are indeed privileged to have with us Professor Dede Utemo, who is the founder and national coordinator of Gaya Nusantara, the first organization for LGBT rights in Indonesia, and he is actually considered the godfather of Indonesia's gay rights movement. So, welcome Dede to our dialogue today. Dede, how is COVID nineteen impacting the lives of LGBT community in the region, mm -hmm. in the context of, say, health services, livelihood, social security? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Shopa, for having me. And uh, this is a very uh, uh, pertinent question. Um, and I think many of us who are on this uh, call, and also uh, who's, who's watching uh, on, on the live stream, have probably uh, you know uh, experienced it. I mean, just one example. I mean, just last week, I went for my you know uh, three monthly uh, HIV and STI test, and but it, it turned out at the, at the local clinic, uh, the S the the uh, STI test is not, was not available, and I asked why. Uh, so the, all the nurses that were usually um, doing the STI tests. were uh, deployed uh, to um uh, covid-19 work uh so that's that's already an example um uh you know uh where services for just people who want uh you know basic sexual health are um you know uh, not available so that's that's just one example um and on the livelihood clearly uh many uh especially trans women uh because they are not connected to their family many of them uh do not have this the the, the safety net uh in this you know i mean um and many of them do you know work like uh, busking or you know sex work and that you know uh, uh you know and or, or actually informal sector work and so they're not they're not earning as much i mean fortunately uh, and i i've seen many uh attempts in here in malaysia in thailand in other places where people ship in or, or do work and you know uh, or you know uh try to to uh, to uh, uh make uh, people i mean you know uh, have, have have employment again uh, at least at least to you know to to uh to be able to to survive uh so So that's 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 what's happened. It it is certainly impacting uh, uh, on on the lives. I'm going something that is uh, I I I'd like to uh, focus actually on because because many uh, uh, many gay men and you know MSM uh, trans women also do sex work. I mean, 
it's just impossible. I mean, if the clients know the risk of actually having sex, you know, um, casual sex right now, you, you just don't do it. So it, it means that there's no income. Yeah, Shobha, back yes, to you. Yes, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That's I, okay. Yeah, you are very yeah. right, Dede, because uh, the general health uh, services are being impaired. They have, all of us have felt that, and we feel scared to fall ill with any illness because uh, most of the hospitals, as you said, they have, and rightly so, they are catering, dealing with the COVID-19 patients. Uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 apart today, day, where are we in the Asia Pacific region in terms mm -hmm. of SRHR for the LGBT populations? Uh, what are the 2020 realities in comparison to the 2030 SDG goals? Uh, I think we, I, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're short of, of, of that goal. Um, we have to actually look at different populations. Um, like um, in terms of uh, services for HIV, I mean, I just mentioned STI is not available. So for, for HIV, it's still available, but it's impacted. Uh, and um, the, the stigma is still there. People are still reluctant to, to, you know, to turn up at, at, at clinics. So that's still uh, happening uh, right now. And then, um, so if, 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 if it's HIV services, um, in many places, it's all right. Uh, the healthcare workers are, uh, have been trained to um, not discriminate against uh, you know, uh, gay men, other MSM, uh, uh, trans women. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more worried about things like you know, uh, services for, uh, for women. Now, if you're lesbian and not married, uh, or if you're a trans man, um, then uh, it's it's still a problem. I mean, it's still not understood. You know, uh, things like pap smear tests and you know um, the like. Uh, there's still a problem right now. I mean, I mean, if you have a very understanding doctor at your clinic, I mean, that's you know, it's, it's you're you're lucky. But but it's not uh, universal. So we're we're really still. Uh, falling behind uh, in terms of 2030 goals. Okay. Uh, so uh, what uh, are the main challenges or the barriers uh, which, uh, are, which the LGBT community is facing, especially men who have sex with men and transgenders in accessing yeah. sexual health services in a rights-based manner? Uh, where are we, for example, progress, as you said, HIV services are by far and large available, <clears throat> but are we on track for the 1990 um, mm -hmm. targets Yeah. for these communities particularly? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, as I said, I mean, you know, uh, in, in, uh, um, but is, uh, a part of the community, those who are already out, who, who, do, who live away from their families, they can probably uh, access the uh, service, and 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 you know, local governments, local authorities have uh, have been flexible about that. Um, so it's it's possible, but not enough. Uh, the majority of you know, gay men, uh, other MSM, uh, uh, trans women are still not accessing services because they are just not sure, and and because the general atmosphere uh, in, in in society. Uh, uh, is not uh, uh, you know it's not ideal it's not conducive and uh, in the past uh, four or five years uh, in, in in especially Muslim majority countries like Indonesia Malaysia um, uh, things have actually regressed have actually uh, gone back uh, in terms of you know attitudes uh, towards gay men other MSM uh, trans women uh, um, I mean there is there is work trying to you know uh, for, uh, to uh, work with uh, local uh, clerics, you know, religious leaders who are uh, accepting, uh, but that's still in the minority. Uh, what is the situation in Indonesia mm -hmm. uh, with regards to these two communities? Yeah, uh, actually, my my my, you know, my, my, the example I mentioned just now. 
uh, the, the, the rather, I mean, they're based on my experience, uh, my direct experience with, uh, with, with local communities. So um, it's uh, especially among young uh, MSM, you know, I mean, it's, uh, there, is, there is this fear and, and actually there There's the threats because they don't they don't learn about you know HIV STIs and other sexual health uh, matters uh, until uh, they already have some kind of symptoms and uh, you know sometimes it's not too late they can they can still get medication but sometimes it is too late. Uh, are discriminatory laws and policies being addressed in the region? Oh, uh, uh, barely. I mean, of course, we have the, ex the good example of India uh, uh, about uh, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, I mean, we, we just had the, uh, the disappointing uh, verdict uh, of the Singapore uh, Supreme Court, uh, which basically just refused to uh, change uh, the uh, Section 377A. Uh, so there's not much happening I mean, um, in the region. I mean, there is a few sparkles like, you know, uh, marriage equality in Taiwan, possibly, you know, a uh, registered partnership in Thailand. But generally speaking, it's still the same old story. Mm -hmm. So uh, in fact, you have taken up some examples because uh, my next uh, question was mm. around any best practice examples you would like to share or some countries doing better than the others. So I would like you to elaborate a little more on that. So those well, who are India, not following those uh, examples, they, they get yeah. some. I mean, the India example, I mean, there, I, I, I know this from the names, there are many people from India here, so that you can also uh, yes. share later. Yes. Um, it's, 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 it's amazing once, you know, section 377 of the Indian penal code was, uh, uh, you know, uh, was, was uh, what is it? Uh, taken off you know, from, from, from the books. Things change, you know? I mean, uh, media could, could do something without any, uh, any threat. Uh, I mean, the threat may not be real, but it's, uh, but it's there. So uh, it's, it's, it, it is, I think people have been saying, it's true that if you change the law towards something that is more uh, accepting of uh, sexual minorities, then, um, so you know, other social other social matters all uh, kind of follow. Uh, so that's that's uh, as an example. I mean, uh, the other best practice is of course Taiwan um, with marriage equality. Now, uh, obvious. I mean, you know, uh, clearly these two uh, uh, examples uh, uh, are are the results of like hard work for years. Uh, we we know the you know the Indian example. You know, uh, people have been <laughs> Lawyers people have worked on it for a decade at least, and in Taiwan also they had to do that, and it's a, it's a lot of. Uh, but I guess you know to to I mean I mean to be optimistic, the atmosphere is uh, is is getting right. I think um, that uh, you know um, at least in the communities they know about these things. Um, uh, the young people now, young MSM, young gay men, young trans women they are aware of other countries. Now, unfortunately, the governments are not, uh, gov you know, uh, but I don't know. I guess we have to wait until younger people, you know, enter the government <laughs> and, and, and hopefully uh, the, have the courage to, to change things towards the better. Okay, and provided they enter the government at a young age and not- <laughs> That's true, yeah. It's uh, it's tricky. I mean, I'm, I, I've been accused of being too optimistic, so I, I take that. I mean, you should take it with a, with a large grain of salt. <laughs> but, but, but still, we would like you to spell out certain steps which need to be taken at the government level, at the level of society. At yeah, well, level society. Of yeah, society is 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 more possible. I mean, uh, especially the local society. I think the example from the Philippines shows that. If you can, if you cannot address central, you know, national government, you do it at the municipalities. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one example. Mm. Um, in some in some places, like like in my own country in Indonesia, the government doesn't want to hear 
uh, I mean, it's, I guess we are still okay. They're not, they're not uh, physically uh, uh, harassing us. Uh, but that's, you know, we, we just wait. We just wait until, as I said, you know, the next, the next batch of politicians hopefully will be more understanding. I mean, you know, I mean, from time to time you have this one, you know, a uh, maverick politician who who dares to actually be different, and even even in, even in the context of Indonesia, even in the context of Singapore, there's always you know usually somebody who's already retired, so they, they've got nothing to lose. So don't 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 dismiss older people. <laughs> no, 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 a, not at all. <laughs> no, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, so, so I think I think what what people have, are doing. I mean, if you look at the examples of India and Taiwan, and what is going on right now in other places like Indonesia, is you work uh, with what you can do. And actually, something that that, that what I learned uh, about uh, what what happened in Indonesia in the past four years is that because the attacks, the verbal attacks at least, are clear, and 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 you know, the attempted legal legal harassment, uh, you know, change change of law into something more conservative, is real. We gain all kinds of allies. Nowadays, if you talk to a human rights lawyer in Indonesia, you don't have to convince them that LGBTI rights are human rights. I mean, you know, I mean, they, they understand. Uh, media, increasingly younger journalists uh, understand that you know you should um, you know uh, so it's it's um, uh, the uh, I mean of course you know we, we we always say we don't want the uh, the victimization the violence but if it does happen it it makes society wake up and said well this is not right and so society is easier the politicians are. I mean, they, they are always calculating anyway. Uh, and, uh, but in some places, um, like in Thailand, I guess it's, it's, it's actually like nothing to lose uh, sort of thing. Um, so I suppose you have to take uh, the different uh, steps, you know, and, and in, some, in some places like, uh, you know, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, it's easier to work with trans issues. Mm. Uh, but not lesbians and gays. So, okay, so the lesbians and gays be, be, be more patient, wait. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's uh, sexual, sexual uh, minority uh, you know, rights is not rocket science. So people, you know, people understand these that if trans people can have rights, why can't you know, other people have rights? Right, right. Do you see uh, this rise mm -hmm. in right wing governments? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is it really? pushing the agenda backwards in some countries yes certainly uh, it's, it's 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 happening uh it's the, and 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 the right wing uh, politicians seem to learn from each other you know even from russia and and you know the the former soviet union uh, uh whatever states mm -hmm. so uh but we should not forget that for 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 you know for maybe 10 politicians who are conservative there may be two that are not. Uh, and I said, said politicians are a bit more difficult because they've got everything to lose and things like that. But uh, there are progressive clerics, young clerics, uh, young uh, pastors in, in churches that, uh, you know, um, think differently, read different texts, and the communities themselves actually produce uh, different uh, discourses. Uh, we, we should not uh, forget uh, social media, uh, where uh, you know it's 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 almost dizzying to see all kinds of uh, you know um, discourses uh, about um, minority uh, sexual minority rights, and 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 people also learn and, and connect the the fact that it is not only sexual minority rights; it's also other minority rights, like minority. Uh, religious sects, um, uh, you know, minority um, ethnic groups. So if you, if you uh, do it together, I mean, it's, 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 it's a long haul, but uh, you can start somewhere, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, thank, thank you, Dede, thank you very much. I think you have set now the stage for uh, a good interaction with the audience. Uh, so, and uh, before I invite the listeners, uh, for their comments and questions. I just wanted to share something which comes to my mind today. Uh, I have mm -hmm. taught in a Roman Catholic school for several years. And many, many years ago, uh, it is run by 
uh, an Irish order of nuns uh, called mm -hmm. L the Loreto order of nuns. And uh, several years ago, I had spoken to the mother general, like she was the head of all the Loreto institutions all over the world. And she had done pioneering work uh, for HIV control in Africa. And on the issue of LGBTI, I was a little skeptical on asking her, she mm. was a Roman Catholic. And she just said, we are all different flowers made by the same God. And we I should bloom equally in the same garden. This is what she said. And that those words still have stuck with me. So That is interesting. Yeah. I, I have something to respond to that. Yes. Usually women, nuns or, you know, um, Yes. Uh, women, uh, Muslim, Muslim women leaders, mm -hmm. they are more ready to mm -hmm. differently open, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, feminism within Islam and Christianity and, and probably other faiths as well is not new. Yeah. It's just one step, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, one more step to actually take it into just everyone. And that includes, of course, LGBT people. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Dede. Really nice uh, to see you. Welcome. And I see a lot of my other friends also. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious that um, mm -hmm. have you heard um, mm -hmm. reports of increased maybe or mm -hmm. of family induced uh, abuse, violence on mm -hmm. some of our LGBTQ groups? Because I know that particularly lesbians are more prone to mm -hmm. that kind of. Um, so I'm just wondering, does it does it really come? Because People stay really quiet. Okay. Yeah, I have seen that on social media as 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 anxiety amongst activists. But I have not actually. I mean, you know, I don't I don't have to uh, hear everything. But I mean, uh, there are no reports yet of. I mean, there is there is a case, uh, but it's it's not. I don't know if it's connected to COVID-19. There is a case of this trans woman in Jakarta that was accused of stealing some wallet or something and was visited by some thugs and was dragged from her uh, room and was beaten up and burned alive. Now, some people say, well, this may be, you know, it's, it's, you know people are panicking fear, crisis, blaming, or it's just, uh, you know, I mean, I know it, this is, of course, academic. So, but it, I mean, one can imagine that could be true. I mean, if you uh, usually live in the big city and can be a bit more free from, uh, you know, mom and dad, when, uh, and, you know, uh, it is it is the custom I mean, in, in, in many places to just go home and, when, you know, because, well, you don't have employment, uh, and it's probably, you know, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to, to, to have a sp safe space. It might not be safe space. And, and that is, uh, so what I've seen is actually warnings uh, from many organizations in the region saying that be careful when you go home. Uh, do you come out or, you know, do be careful. Don't, don't, don't come out if it's not right and things like that. So it's, uh, it's still at that stage for me at least, yeah. I don't know if other people have uh, heard of a uh, uh, you know, real, real instance. Yes. So you have a question from uh, Indonesia. Yeah, uh, from, by, uh, from uh, Rita Vidyadana. She is a very senior yes. journalist from there. And uh, mm -hmm. so Rita, would you like to ask your question yourself? She has put it in the chat box. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Good do. afternoon, Prof. Dede. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Marita. Marita. Mm -hmm. uh, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is uh, LGBTQ community in Indonesia mm -hmm. and elsewhere in the Asia Pacific countries have always mm -hmm. been grappling with stigma and various yes. forms of discrimination when it comes to obtaining sexual reproductive health and rights information mm -hmm. and services in Indonesia, too. It, but in this current COVID-19 outbreak, the stigma mm -hmm. is much more intense, especially in uh, rural and even mm -hmm. in urban area. How yeah. do you suggest uh, the community deal with this situation? Because they are mostly excluded in like uh, having rapid tests mm -hmm. and having other health services during this outbreak. So. How do you suggest them to uh, deal with this situation? This is because 
this is very dangerous for this community. Yes. Well, it, it's actually two steps. One, the first step is actually, I mean, I guess uh, there are many existing organizations um, in, in, in the region, um, you know, gay organizations, trans organizations, lesbian organizations. They should be uh, more, um, they should do, uh, you know, their work uh, in, 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 in trying to have to get connections uh, in the in the in the in the in the health uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, um, maybe through uh, different sectors. For example, gay men tend to know the doctors. So, you know, I think organizations should should work through them, and 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 you know, uh, so, and then so the people in from the community. Uh, this is the time not to be, you know, uh, kind of uh, too afraid. I mean, uh, you know, for for our for 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 our own sake, you know, uh, come to the organizations. Uh, I mean, there are, there are many examples. I mean, you know, of of uh, sometimes, uh, of course, you know, you mentioned health, uh, Marita, uh, uh, which is important. And um, but many uh, many gay men and trans women know. As I said, uh, doctors in, in in the in the local hospitals. So use those connections, volunteer. I mean, some some some. Uh, I know some some gay men in Jakarta. They're out of work. You know what they do? They go to the hospitals. We'd like to volunteer, because at least they get to eat three times a, a day. <laughs> they got food, and they do something good. So so this is, and you don't even have to come out when you volunteer. Okay, things like that. But Organizations are have many organizations have a good uh, relationship with uh, with the local hospital. So if uh, you know, um, and so so that should be used. Uh, but I think I'm 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 thinking also more on on some on on the the the, the, the you know the livelihood issues. Um, just around me, for example, there are many young gay men, uh, young trans women who are out of work. Uh, you know, um, and 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 this. Um, what we are trying to do is, you know, find something. I know uh, there is a group of trans women in Jakarta that is, that is uh, creative. They go to the hospital and said, "Look, we we all can sew. Uh, do you want us to make masks for you?" <laughs> and 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 so five uh, like five to two shifts. So ten trans women are sewing masks for the hospital. So it's good for the hospital. But it's also income for the for the trans women, and, and, and temporary. But uh, what what else can you do uh, at this time? Because many many informal sector work is is off right now. Yeah, so so um, this needs to be uh, spread. I, I, it is already happening. I, I I'm I'm seeing it from in in, in Thailand. I'm seeing it in in in, uh, in in the Philippines. I'm seeing it in Indonesia. People are, you know, uh, doing all kinds of things to to help each other, which is good. Uh, we have a, a video of Sonal. Hello, everyone. My name is Sonal Mehta, and I am the regional director of International Planned Parenthood Federation in the South Asia region. We are all in lockdown due to COVID nineteen, and we are all wondering when is this getting over. But there are small gains within this opportunity. Many of us are coming closer to our families. We are talking to them more. We are engaging with them more. While I do that, I often think of my friends, my LGBTQ friends, my gay, lesbian, transgender, queer, and bisexual friends who often are abused, exploited, and even sometimes violated by their own family members. I think of them and wonder what is happening to them. Although when I open my Facebook, I'm so excited to see that quite a few of transgender organizations, quite a few of my transgender friends, be it Abhina, Simran, Lakshmi, Rudrani, um, Ramkali, many of them have actually reached out, made food packages, giving clothes to their other transgender people, to their other transgender friends who are not able to go out, get food or anything like that. Mind you, they are also keeping um, in line with the government rules and regulations. I also see a lot of gay friends 
providing peer support and psychosocial support to their friends. And that's really heartwarming. And I wish I could see more of my lesbian friends who are able to really reach out to the other friends. The group that I really am con concerned most about it, our lesbian friends, because often we hear that they are the people who get exploited when they are more confided in this kind of situation. I really hope that all friends are able to get their own freedom, their own expression, and their own warmth. In the time of COVID, while it is extremely important to keep lockdown and to make sure that COVID doesn't spread, it is also important to think about sexual reproductive health, to think about mental health, and to think about well-being well overall. While we all think about our own well-being, I really, really hope and wish that we don't forget our gay, lesbian, transgender, and queer friends. All of us stay safe and take care. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I lovely. would, uh, yes, I would like, Arif Jafar is there with us, I think. Oh, Arif, yeah. Hi, Arif. Uh, yes. So, Arif, would you like to say something? And uh, before that, uh, for the benefit of our, our audience, Arif is founder of Bharosa Trust and uh, has been member of NAS Foundation for years. And he has dedicated his life to fighting for human rights for LBGT communities in India and abroad. And we cannot forget when he faced a 47 days prison term due to criminalization of MSM uh, activities at that time. So mm -hmm. welcome Arif and please share your thoughts. Hello Arif. Hello, <laughs> hello everybody. Hello, hello. Sonal. It is uh, nice to see you, uh, Sonal and Dede, after such a long time, and also yeah. Shoba. Yes, hi. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are uh, uh, in a difficult situation these days. Uh, we have been trying to help uh, reach out to the community members in the cities of uh, uh, Lucknow, Sitapur, Lakhimpur, Shravasti, Balrampur, Kasganj. And uh, we are trying our best to distribute some rations and some give some cash money for daily usage. Things are tough in UP because of all the government regulations. Mm, we have been trying to sneak down uh, because um, in Lucknow especially, they have given an order that uh, whatever rations has to be distributed, it has to be done through the government uh, agency. Mm. And NGOs are not supposed to do it directly. <laughs> but uh, um, well, uh, though we are following the government um, orders and regulations, uh, we know that it is difficult for government agencies to reach um, to the LGBT members. Mm -hmm. So we are doing through from one to one uh, on one to one basis and um, not making a gathering. So, but yeah, it is difficult. It is really difficult, but it has been good uh, response um, in uh, rural areas where Balrampur is. Mm -hmm. uh, we supposedly there are going to be some stricter measures in uh, Lucknow from tomorrow onwards um, after this lockdown, because Lucknow with the 29 um, corona patients, it is uh, uh, a red area, marked as a red area. Aww. So, but uh, we are still trying to reach out to all the community members through WhatsApp and through mobile and trying to help as much as we can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Arif. Uh, and we are uh, happy to have with us Roy Vadia, uh, Regional yeah, Communications hi. Advisor at UNFPA, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Office in Bangkok. No, I mean, you've all said pretty much what I feel. Uh, this is a strange time for sure. Mm. And we don't know how long it will last. We hope, of course, it will be shorter, but all indications are that it will continue for a while. Mm -hmm. It's a chance to really reflect and connect and find ways to take our work forward 
in a much more strategic and much more compassionate way. Strategic because I think the world is seeing that unless you really address the needs of the most marginalized and the most vulnerable, we will not collectively be able to progress as a uh, human race. And I know that sounds very cliched, but I'm seeing this uh, being uh, voiced in so many different ways across so many platforms. You see it in editorials and all the key um, publications. You see it being voiced by NGOs, by the uh, UN ordinary people. There are so many Facebook groups and things that are sprouting up called viral kindness, you know. Um, so I think mm. it's a good time to really take all that we've been doing and find a way to make it come together and then post-pandemic what? Um, of course, the challenges will be huge because of the economic fallout of the pandemic. We are already seeing that uh, key services in some areas are being sacrificed for other priority areas. For instance, in our own work, um, we work a lot with, um, for instance, uh, you know, the uh, midwives who are out there in the field helping uh, women and girls in the most um, horrible situations like uh, Cox's uh, Bazaar, for instance. And we're hearing uh, that even this uh, life-saving work in some ways has been compromised because they're not getting the uh, personal protection equipment that they need because it's being diverted for other kinds of um, health uh, services. And I think in terms of the funding allocations as well for the kind of work that we do for the LGBTI communities and for sex workers, we may be challenged to get that going forward all the more. So we actively need to strategize on how will we position the work that we do and the constituencies that we serve all the more strategically and cleverly and to put compassion at the heart of it because I think that's the argument right now that has a very strong cachet. I'm under no um, illusions, of course, that this is not going to be um, easy, but I think if we bring ourselves together, we can find ways to advocate for it. I'm seeing a lot of appetite with young people, with free mm. people to reach out to those that they might not have earlier thought about. So mm. if you capitalize on this sense of shared humanity and find a way to package it and to really advocate for it and then to map out the most practical steps, the funding that we need and for what, to really spell it out in a very practical, easy to understand way. Of course, uh, human rights and all of the things that we work under, but what are the practical things needed to ensure that uh, no one is left behind? So I'm not sure if I'm really articulating myself very well, but I sense that we have a chance right now to really seize this moment and this opportunity and to coalesce in a way that we haven't in the past. And I'd like to be very frank over here and also acknowledge that just like the, the uh, real world, shall we say, the NGO, mm -hmm. the uh, civil society world is also one that is riven with division and with conflict. Yeah, of course. We compete with each other for funding, just like the UN agencies and, you know, sometimes compete with, with each other for funding. And there is a lot of uh, politics and a lot of backbiting and uh, conflicts. I think we really have to, you know, put an end to this because if we can't come together and be one, then people are going to exploit that and we will never be able to achieve what we need to collectively achieve. So I think let's take a long, hard look at ourselves as well and see where we've been uh, lacking and how we can fill those gaps and really come together going forward. So I'll just end it with that. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. That's yes, better. Yes. Now, so this people... question is from Tasnia Ahmed from Bangladesh. Yes. And she says it is really hard to make out the demands. Even the food medicines are not being mm. fulfilled according to the demands as well. Uh, what is the LGBTQ focused activities from WHO or gender transform transformative approaches? Not only stigma, uh, and ignoring their rights in our mm -hmm. country, Bangladesh also. So what can be your recommendations to deal with this crisis? 
Yes, that's well, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, I guess, you know, uh, echoing what Roy said, I mean, this is a special time. And, you know, a time of crisis sometimes gives opportunities as well. This is a time to act, you know, maybe the government has <laughs> a big heart, <laughs> hopefully, and then you could actually you know, uh, lobby with them and, 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 and you know, uh, pay attention to, uh, maybe you start with trans women, uh, because I know, uh, at least from, from reading and, you know, that in Bangladesh, uh, it's, 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 it's easier when you deal with trans women. Uh, sorry if I'm wrong, but, um, and then uh, my experience working with uh, LGBT communities is that, you know, trans women have gay friends, have lesbian friends. Well, bring the friends along when you go to the clinic. You don't have to announce who they are. They're just your friends, right? <laughs> so um, I'm sure people know all kinds of ways of, you know, uh, we don't have to really be out, out you know, be a principal, but basically just uh, bring people along. And, and I think I said earlier how if, uh, I mean, if I can go use uh, the example of Indonesia, many LGBT, I mean, okay, many gay and trans organizations are very close with the doctors and the hospitals. Use those connections. Of course, you know, you want to help other people too. Some, some people actually say something like this, like those, those gay guys that volunteer in, at the hospital in Jakarta, uh, you should be a bit out there. You know, when, when, when you're accepted as volunteers and then people say that gay, gay men, trans women are also, you know, are good for to other people. So, so it's not, it's not being selfish just for ourselves, but also it's a chance to, you know, for everybody, to, uh, for, for the, for the gay men, trans women to show that they care about other people and, but also to, uh, to, uh, lobby the government. Um, I hope I answer your question, uh, Tasnia. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Swapna Majumdar. Somehow she was here till now. She would have loved to ask it herself. So okay. she says that despite the difficult circumstances, there have been many positive initiatives. Mm. And it would be great to hear about some inspiring stories that could be shared with journalists because I would love to write about them. Ah. So anybody, because in India also, in some parts, the transgenders have come out, transgender women. Uh, and they have been distributing food packets and helping uh, the others during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. Something that uh, I've seen a lot in, in tweets uh, and Instagram captions mm -hmm. from young uh, LGBT people mm -hmm. is that, you know, uh, something that is actually interesting. They mm -hmm. say, we are used to difficulties. Mm -hmm. We are used to being afraid mm -hmm. every day of our life. Mm -hmm. So let's, I mean, so let's actually uh share this i mean not not share the fear but share the way we cope with the fear uh with other people so you know it's something like that. so it's in, it's interesting people come up with these ideas you know and um uh like i, I earlier i told the story of the of, of the group of trans women who are sewing masks for the for the yeah. hospital it's a small deed Thanks. um and it's uh but it's 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 helping to the community and, you know, uh, in passing, the nurses at the hospital say, oh, yeah, by the way, these are sewn by trans people. <laughs> yes, 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 so it yes. actually reduces the stigma, you know, that trans people can also help other people. Right. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Imran from Pakistan. Yes. Uh, and it reads that in Pakistan, the transgender women are leading the movement, mm, uh, especially go. after the Trans Protection Act mm. 2018. Uh, there are a lot of gaps still. But in the current situation, 96% transgender mm. people and lost their yes. source of earning, which is, I think, a world a phenomenon elsewhere too. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yes, it's everywhere. And uh, not only LGBT community, but others are also losing their jobs mm. and they are without work. Uh, yeah. We have lot many workers in India elsewhere who are working in the informal sector who have just been, mm. who are just nowhere now. Yeah. And uh, they are suffering for basic things for livelihood. And SRHR movement has been pushed back, yeah. it says. And then, um, Dede, there's a question from Nandini Majumdar, yeah. who's working with Asia Sp uh, Safe Abortion Partnership. Mm -mm. And uh, she says that during this pandemic, it has affected the LGBT community and how are the movements responding to the mm. issues emerging due to COVID-19. Mm. Uh, since gatherings and meetings are not possible anymore, and is the government responding in any way in terms of addressing health issues, economic issues, and stigma that was already there? 
I think many governments are not responding uh, correctly. That's why I, I, I said earlier, we, uh, we, you know, as as uh, organizations, we we could put pressure on the government to, to you know, to pay more attention, and then perhaps the sense of crisis uh, will uh, will make them um, make you know exceptions, you know, and and doing work with LGBTQ community. So that's that's one way of doing it. Um, Yes, uh, gatherings are impossible, but uh, I think uh, you know LGBT young, especially young LGBT people are 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 used to communicate, you know, connecting uh, virtually, and so that needs to be that that needs to be uh, used, uh, utilized. Um, so um, yeah, and then come come with uh, creative ideas about what those things. So it's. Um, uh, we have a question, Dede, from Vic mm -hmm. Salas. I think. Ah, yeah, I yeah, Yes, yes. Uh, he wants to know if there are any ongoing efforts to document the impact of COVID on other health services, for example, routine services such as immunization for children, mm -hmm. HIV diagnosis mm -hmm. and treatment services, and transgender specific health services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two things. Huh? Yes. As far as I know, people are aware of the effect on services. I mean, in, in different in different countries, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it's being documented. Uh, I haven't seen any, uh, you know, uh, published uh, work. But maybe people are still, you know, uh, the process uh, of writing, perhaps. process of writing, or you know, document. But it's 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 actually a good idea. It's it's uh, it, it just. You know, it it, uh, uh, it comes to people's mind immediately. Now, transgender uh, specific services, I'm not sure. I mean, um, uh, is there anybody from Thailand who knows about the Tangerine Clinic in uh, Bangkok? That's one uh, trans specific service that I know. Um, and what does it mean? And you know, um, yeah, I guess there's nobody. I mean, I'll, I'll, but something I'll, I'll to for me to to find out uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have uh, a comment from Karmi Kanila from Philippines. Mm. Karmi, would you like to ask or speak yourself? Good afternoon to everyone. Um, hello, hello, Karmi. Yes, many thanks for uh, calling out my name. Uh, it's uh, so far uh, all of our healthcare system nationwide, both of mm -hmm. the national and the local government units have been uh, mm -hmm. all hands are, are on deck so to speak uh, yeah. against the covid now uh, i am uh, i am just worried that uh, uh, there will be services uh, that will not be uh, accessible anymore mm -hmm. to certain uh, sectors of our lgbtq now I, I teach at the university of the philippines and one of the courses that i teach is also uh, 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 dynamics no, in, in, in human sexuality and uh, even before even before the COVID has arrived and wrecked havoc there have been uh, inequity uh, suffered by uh, certain sectors no? for example in the in the provinces uh, if uh, it's a, uh, a long-term coughing uh, uh, and uh, the patient happens to be a gay who happens to come from Cebu City or Manila City, they would eventually, the doctor would eventually say, oh, okay, that's, uh, he, he has HIV. So there is that stigma already. You know? But oh. if let's say a, a patient who is a farmer, who's, uh, who's an elderly and who has mm. a long-term cough, and they will just say, ah, okay, that's uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. And that was mm. before uh, COVID and this this uh, this story I personally I personally experienced this uh, in southern Mindanao no? and uh, and this has just happened two years ago no? now uh, uh, fast forward now with COVID the more that there will be a stigma uh, through the Philippines has a very high index on. Uh, 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 equity, no equity and equality, but uh, uh, down into the barangay, into the village level, we see, uh, we see uh, inequity among our LGBTQ. Now, uh, uh, number two, uh, many of our 
uh, fellow LGBTQs uh, have are members of the they they earn their income from uh, the informal sector, yes, uh, uh, and they have been disenfranchised because of uh, the lockdown, and we do oh, not right course. now we do not see uh, the figures the the figures the the uh, how much is that impact going to affect mm -hmm. them. Because what we're seeing is uh, at the national level, uh, yeah. we're not seeing any disaggregation of data. Mm -hmm. And that, that worries me. That worries me because mm -hmm. uh, what after several months of uh, lockdown, mm -hmm. what will happen uh, yeah. to these uh, uh, sectors in the informal, uh, 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 small, small, medium enterprises where our LGBTQs are. Mm -hmm. So... So that uh, right now we don't see any uh, any discriminations against them, mm -hmm. but uh, no, I I I would like to avert that if ever that yes. happens. Of course. But then uh, we are also tied up because our um, finite uh, small resources are into mm -hmm. uh, COVID. So that worries yes. me a lot right now. <laughs> Uh, Carmi, can I request you to please introduce yourself? Sorry, I, I am Carmelita Canila. I, uh, uh, I'm an assistant professor. I'm a medical doctor, but I oh. teach also at the University of the Philippines uh, College of Public Health. I am the current chair of uh, the Department of uh, Health Policy and Administration, as well as the current chair of the Masters in Health and in Hospital uh, Administration. And then we have um, uh, rather a message from Fita Utami. Uh, yes. Of course, addressed to David that the One Vision Alliance Indonesia is trying to mm -hmm. map the SR services provision. Uh, and we'll update the result by next week. Yeah. Uh, and so. Sonal also has uh, is sharing that the Samad Clinics of Alliance India mm. uh, are providing food, condoms, and HIV testing door to door on call. So some some positive things or some yeah. of the positive work which is, which is being done yes and uh, we had a question from uh, um, martin from rwanda he had sent a question earlier and i oh. think it needs to be answered because because mm, sure. they, for lack of information in many of us even about the existing treatments and all and martin wants to know do we have so far discovered drugs or vaccines for most of the sexually transmitted diseases, uh, including HIV AIDS. Uh, you know, it, HIV and the AIDS uh, in the Philippines, we consider them as, you know, uh, a long-term, a chronic disease like uh, probably diabetes. So there are available uh, available uh, drugs uh, already, you know, to at least uh, control and decrease the level of viral load. And the, and the patient, the person goes back to you know, a normal life. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, there should be no stigma. Uh, however, what is worse is that most of the times uh, we are limited. You know, the access is very limited yes, that is uh, a problem. To, this, uh, to these drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, either the government uh, shoulders mm -hmm. the cost of treatment. Uh, and uh, in that case, it, uh, that's the way in the Philippines as well. Uh, number two is the asymmetry of information. Yeah. So the information does not reach you know, to, uh, down to the community level, to the individual level. So those who are better informed usually gets, uh, gets the treatment uh, for free. Uh, and uh, number three, you know, health workers always have this, uh, you know, even if we try, we deny it, health workers always have this... Uh, biases against people with HIV. We, we still encounter that wow. even in our fields. Uh, that's because uh, they don't know anything about the disease. They lack information about transmission, etc. So they limit no, they limit the provision of uh, services. So I think that's that's worry, worrisome. That's even worse than having a lack of vaccine against uh, certain diseases. For example, in one of our uh, uh, biggest hospitals at the national level, usually uh, they would like to know if the medical doctor, uh, who's a surgeon, uh, they would like to know if the medical doctor has HIV or not. And we think that, no, you, you don't have to, 
uh, th this information is unnecessary because we all know mm -hmm. that the transmission is uh, is this. So I think that's uh, uh, these are the things you know, that uh, that uh, prohibit the full provision of services to our patients with HIV and uh, rather than the lack of vac vaccine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, we have a, a comment from Ika Nindyas of uh, Indonesia. So, hi everyone. My name is Ika and I'm coming from uh, Pilar Yet Center, IPPA Central Java. And okay. Yeah, actually, uh, I've seen several crowdfunding campaign on social media yeah. uh, and not only on several cities, but also spreading all around Indonesia. And I hope uh, that uh, campaign, that crowdfunding campaign, uh, really distributed to all uh, the impacted LGBTQ communities, not mm, not only several people that join on the communities. Because when I, when I talk about this with my friends in Semarang, Indonesia, uh, we don't really know about the condition of the LGBTQ in uh, our city, but uh, the government said that they already uh, have a uh, list of people that they need to uh, cover, but I don't really know whether they consider about the LGBTQ or not, but uh, that's a good thing that people all around the world is talking about and uh, taking forward for the crowdfunding campaign. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, and I just wanted to share that Ika uh, comes from an organization which has a very interesting name called uh, GUSO. Uh, get up and speak out, so, uh -huh. <laughs> which is what we all need to do. Yes. And Dede, uh, um, we would like uh, some take home message from you. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, as I said uh, earlier, um, crises uh, tend to, act uh, to make us think about opportunities, uh, which is a good thing. So be creative, think of what you can do. Do things small if necessary. You know, you don't have to cover all the world or all the province. If you can help, you know, uh, like young people in your neighborhood get employment, think of, you know, uh, so this is where you think out of the box. Um, you know, uh, since, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes staying at home, uh, uh, you know, uh, m makes you think of things that you didn't think about uh, because you're too busy you know, going about, uh, so be creative, think of the things and, you know, um, as, as Roy said, this is going to be a, a long time, even, even if the, if the, if the pandemic kind of, you know, uh, subsides, we still have to be careful. And so need, we need, you know, people still need to, to, to survive. And, you know, Ika mentioned crowdfunding. Yes, we need to do that. Uh, but, you know, uh, open yourselves to people and they will probably come to you. Thank you, Dede. And Thank one you. last attempt to bring in Dr. Jana. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jana, if you could please unmute yourself and uh, we are really very keen to listen to you. So, yes, I think, yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, finally. Thank you, finally. Hello. Patience does pay. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, to invite us and to be uh, with you and to share our experience, uh, particularly uh, the, in the red light districts, what sex was mm. present uh, facing one of the hardest, uh, I think, challenge of its yeah. time. Yeah. That lockdown has stopped movement of sex workers mm. as well as clients in one yeah. So they are still in the red light districts because most of them uh, can't move uh, as mm. the declaration was uh, quick and sudden. So they have to live in this place at the same time uh, without any earning. How they can actually manage to have their two square meal a day is a big issue. So from uh, Durbar Mohila Samanai Committee, the largest sex workers collective who has been uh, set up a sort of uh, food dispersal centers, uh, which is in operation since last 10 days. Uh, with the help of the friends of Durbar, as well as other, uh, I think, voluntary organization and institution like Ram Krishna Mission, like Bharat Sevasram, and many individuals, 
has donated to us to buy the basic necessities like um, uh, rice, pulses, uh, oil, I mean vegetable oil and so on and so forth. So that we have been uh, providing to around 17,000 sex workers living in Calcutta in different red light districts. We are also coordinating in other uh, red light districts like in um, uh, in the state of West Bengal through, uh, I think, establishing contact with other organizations uh, who are providing uh, similar sort of support, which also uh, to the, uh, the number is around 25,000. Uh, but we are now at a dire strait because having a plan to provide it till 15th of April, now we are facing that it has to be continued till 31st April. Uh, and, and that's the biggest challenge. I don't know where from we'll be able to uh, uh, manage uh, this amount of uh, food and other substances. That's one thing. Second thing, as we are uh, suggesting all the sex workers not to entertain clients, even if yeah. they are coming close by, uh, that has to be stopped uh, for the time being. So we also have the same moral responsibility, at least mm. uh, if I, everyone says, if I uh, uh, do not take any clients, then work from I will earn money. So mm. that's another big problem. But so uh, we are trying our level best to raise crowdfunding and so on and so forth. Yeah. Secondly, uh, in addition to that, what we started long before lockdown, even in the early part of March, uh, we actually provided advisories to the sex workers uh, through door-to-door -door visiting, then followed by we uh, printed some leaflets and posters and then through uh, I think we did another campaign with the help of uh, people actually moving with some tricycle and giving messages to the sex workers. So to large extent at this juncture, sex workers are quite aware of the disease but the mm. problem is what we suggested them to use as for example, masks, which are not available. I mean, we are trying our level best, but we could uh, manage to get one-tenth of the requirement. Second is, well, when you are suggesting that frequent washing of hands with soap, in some places water is plenty, no problem in city Calcutta, but there are districts where water is not that plenty, and also to provide soaps to them. Because sanitizer is not available in at least mm -hmm. eastern part of India. So these are bigger challenges. So I just like to raise these issues and to all of our friends and colleagues, uh, if uh, uh, any one of you establish linkages with other organizations or you yourselves also, raise our issue and raise our funds. I know Sonal is laughing. Uh, but but what is important for us is a question of survival at this juncture. I think this is uh, what uh, the brief I like to share with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jana, for being there online and raising very very pertinent issues. And uh, now we will uh, look at the video which Roy had uh, so kindly sent to us. Hello from Bangkok. This is Roy Wadia. Thank you so much for asking me to share my thoughts about how the current pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, may be affecting MSM um, communities and people across um, Asia and the Pacific. I can't speak in broad terms completely because I'm not in all countries, of course, but it stands to uh, reason that the most uh, vulnerable and the, and the most uh, marginalized um, communities and people would be the, the most affected, uh, possibly, by uh, COVID-19, not just in terms of their physical uh, vulnerability to the pandemic, that of course, but also the socioeconomic factors. 
When you think about it, um, MSM um, communities are usually amongst the most uh, marginalized. Many gay people, many MSM, have been uh, basically uh, thrown out by their families or they don't have the social support system that they need. And they really depend on each other to be their families and to be their communities. So think about it, at a time of social uh, distancing when you can't step out when you're in quarantine or in uh, lockdown, the support system that you have, even though there is uh, technology of course, it's not there anymore, it's not there physically. Uh, the safe spaces that you had as uh, the community, for instance, uh, drop-in centers and such, they aren't at this moment accessible. So there is a deeper sense of isolation. I mean, we're all feeling isolated to a, to a certain extent, uh, living alone or even with uh, families being cooped up in the same space. But for a gay person who may not be on good terms with their families, who may be disenfranchised, if they are forced once again to be in that same environment, it will add possibly to the uh, tensions that they feel and they are cut off from their uh, uh, support system. The other thing that I've been seeing, because I'm on several uh, WhatsApp groups uh, with the HIV positive community, for instance, uh, back in India, and other um, community groups, is that there is a lack of access to uh, medication in many places. The supply chains, the supply systems are not working in the same way anymore. Uh, for instance, I've seen in certain states back in India, ART is not consistently supplied these days. They have been stuck out in the past, but these have been further exacerbated. I know that the uh, government is trying to do what it can to ensure that uh, the supplies, the uh, medication, to uh, get to those who, um, you know, who, uh, who shall we say, uh, depend on them. But um, it's not uh, consistent, and there is a sense of fear amongst uh, many that they might not get their medications on time. So obviously, that could have a uh, damaging impact on their health. I think the important thing is that the pandemic is not just affecting, of course, MSM communities and the LGBTI communities. It's actually, you know, this is something that's uh, truly impacting the whole world. And I know it sounds a bit um, cliched, but this is a chance for us to take stock of who we are as people, who we are as, um, you know, communities, societies, countries. and. When we think about the SDGs, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals that all countries have said that they will aspire to, the basic premise, the basic uh, vision is to leave uh, no one behind. And who is it that hasn't to be left behind? It's the most marginalized, and that includes the LGBTIQ communities, that includes people living with uh, disabilities, that includes so many on the fringes, on the margins, indigenous people, and so many other groups that at the best of times during uh, so-called peacetime are already at a considerable uh, disadvantage. So think about them at this time of the pandemic and add that factor multiplied uh, many more times. So in taking stock of where we are going as a human race, I think, we need to really take stock of who it is that we are trying to reach and need to reach and how will we reach them all the better going forward. So I see this as a real opportunity perhaps to take a long hard look at ourselves as uh, countries, societies, governments, the uh, UN system, to ask ourselves whether we really made all the efforts we can to do all that we can to support and to uh, reach the most uh, marginalized, and that of course includes MSM. So that's a very broad question, that's a very big picture, but I think we need to ask ourselves that, because from that in question and the answers that it will hopefully bring forth, we can then chart the way forward. For the immediate future, let's not forget to put MSM and the LGBTIQ communities more uh, broadly at, um, if not the heart, at least a co-equal heart of the um, development efforts that we are seeing at this time. There are so many people that we have to reach, women, girls, 
But let's not sacrifice one for the other. Let's make a concerted effort to truly reach everyone that has to be reached. And that includes the most practical things, like I said, supply chains for HIV medication. That includes making sure that the communities can stay in touch. And for that, of course, they have to take charge of their own lives in that way because we do have the technology, we do have the connectivity. I've seen, for instance, from India and so many other uh, places that there are these online communities now that are doing what they can to connect and to uh, be in touch. And that is uh, truly encouraging. And I've been on a couple of those um, sessions and I've been uh, truly encouraged to see that people are you know, doing what they can to ensure that their um, communities and that their fellow citizens are getting what they need whether it's food supplies, medication, just the psychosocial uh, support. So, yeah, I would sort of end with that, that the sense of connection, the sense of being one, really, is more accentuated than it's ever been, I think, in my uh, living uh, memory. So let's take this pandemic as a true opportunity to go forward and to rebuild much more strongly and to truly um, convert lip service into concrete action and to hold governments, the UN, civil society and all stakeholders accountable. But of course, at the end of the day, we as uh, MSM, LGBTIQ communities have to take charge of our own lives and our, and our own uh, destinies. And I think this has given us a chance to strategize all the more sharply in a much more focused way. So with that, uh, I'll take a leave and thank you for asking me to share my thoughts. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. And with this, we come to the end of the sixth episode of our APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, in which we were in conversation with Professor Dede Otomo, the National Coordinator of Gaya Nusantra, the first organization for LGBT rights in Indonesia. I thank Dede once again for being with You're us welcome, here today. Shopa and making this dialogue possible despite his very, very busy schedule. And special thanks to all our esteemed audience for their active and meaningful participation. Thank you. Thank you. APCR SHR 10 Dialogues is a special series of fortnightly online interviews with leaders from the Asia Pacific region on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific region, 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities. It is co-hosted by APCR, SHR 10, and CNS. And these online interviews are streamed live every fortnight from February to May and perhaps beyond that on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.